world. <laughs> Driving, do you need a party? everybody out this morning. I'd like to welcome everybody to By His Blood Ministries. I'd like to say Happy Father's Day to all the fathers and everybody watching at home. This morning I'm uh, I'm reading out of Luke 6 and uh, we went over this lesson this week in, in, uh, in youth and or last week and this uh this verse has really like, stuck out to me and I've uh, been kind of chewing on it all week. It's Luke 6 and 46. Build your house on the rock. And this is Jesus talking. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them... I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundations on the rock. And when he, a flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. 
When the stream broke against it, immediate, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. So you see two different two different men. You got one building a, a house on a, a firm foundation on the rock, and uh, one who was building their house on an unstable foundation. But this right here, the, the opening of it says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I do not do what I tell you? <coughs> it's it really just kind of penetrated my heart this week because as a Christian, it's easy to fall into a place of complacency where you just doing things without meaning. We can fall into a place where we. Just going through the motions and singing and but are you really putting your heart into it? Are you really meaning what you're saying? Are you really being obedient to God? Are you digging deep to find that firm foundation, to find that rock? Because we know that all of us, no matter what walk of of life you're in, we're all going to go through the storms. We're all going to, life's going to be life, and I always say it. Things will come at you. Uh, life can throw you a curveball. Are you digging deep? Are you building your house on a firm foundation on the rock, which is Jesus Christ? Because if you are, no matter what comes your way, you'll be able to withstand it. It's like a, a palm tree that's the roots of the, the palm trees are are rooted so deep that when the storms come they'll bend but they won't break. So if you're here today I pray that you're building your, your house your life, your entire being on the rock and on the word because you know God's not going to fail you. He's not going to leave you, and you'll be able to withstand whatever's thrown your way. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for another day. Thank you for the opportunity to come to your house and hear your word. Thank you for this time that we can come and lift up our songs and our praise and our worship to you, God, because you are worthy. There is none that's like you. You are the only one and true living God. And we worship you today. We thank you today. We thank you for being a good father, God, for being that perfect example of how we should live our lives. My God, we welcome your Holy Spirit today to do what only the Holy Spirit can do. Pray for anybody that doesn't know you, Lord. <coughs> Holy Spirit, please draw them in. Let them come to the altar today and give their life to you. Pray for any that are sick, any that are hurting, any that are broken. I pray healing. I pray God shall meet them however you want to meet them, in any way that you want to meet them, Lord. And uh, answer prayers, Lord. I pray for the praise and worship this morning. Be with them. I know they're, they're going to do amazing. I've already heard them this morning. and God, I just can't wait to lift up this praise to you. Be with Pastor Scott as he brings the message. Let it be your words this morning. Use him as the vessel that... that, uh, that brings forth your message, God, and we look forward to it. God, we just give you all the, the praise, all the worship. We just lift up your name this morning, Jesus. You're what it's all about. Thank you, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Okay. Um, thank you, Jenny, for bringing the word. I just want to say that today's Father's Day. I want to say Happy Father's Day to all your fathers out there. Um, I love you. God loves you. He's, he's very, you know, the man's the head of the household, and it's, he's made to lead. So, the thing about it, when you get yourself right, uh, God can use you to allow everything else to come into play. Your kids back to be a leader for the family. So, fathers are very important. There are leaders. Um, like I said, we need to give men the lead for sure. So. And happy birthday, Jesus. He's my heavenly father. I love him. And uh, like I said, I lost my father, but I had the best father ever. And um, hopefully God will let me 
allow hearing hear me say that I love you, Dad. I'm very grateful that you're here and, and that you're raising me right. Um, like I said, so this day is very special for me. Like I said, I have the best father ever. I have the best heavenly father. And some encouragement to you guys that don't have a father and he was never there. It said that God will be a father to the fatherless. Amen. So remember that because you don't have a father or an earthly father, the heavenly father said that he'll be a father to the fatherless. And that'll mean something to some of you guys because, like you said, you grew up in home, maybe your dad wasn't there and stuff like that. But God has promised you to take you under his wing, to father you, to correct you, to help you, to teach you, to love you, to prosper you, not to harm you. So remember that. You have a heavenly father that is for you and loves you and wants you to do good. Not, you know, plans not to harm you, but to prosper. Remember, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I came to give you life and life more abundantly. That's from your father. Amen. Just praise God. We stand up and just praise God. If you want to run and shout, if you want to lift your hands, if you want to say amen, you know, saying just, just allow the Holy Spirit to move in this place because we desperately need to touch with God.
so, so good. Jesus 
Jesus, you are in my hand, and no one is able to snatch you out of my hand. No one is able to snatch you out of my Father's hand. That's how secure he has you. You are never, listen to me, you are never too far gone. Oh, we messed up. Oh, no, we messed up once again. It's over. You know what? That, that conviction that the Holy Spirit puts on us to go, well, it's not made of what's the I shouldn't do that anymore. And walk in the Spirit and truth and we move into the right direction. responsibilities that we have as a, as a father, um, as a parent in general, 
is uh, is bringing our kids up in Christ and uh, teaching our children to to know Jesus, to know uh, what was done on our behalf, to know uh, why it was done, to know uh, just to know Jesus personally. And I mean, and that's that's what's missing from a lot of children today. Um, and you know, is it all the parents' fault? It's hard to put blame all on anyone ever. Uh, we also have to look at the world that they're living in. We also have to look at uh, what's being taught, uh, you know, in our schools and, and, and just look at the, the total picture. But at the end of the day, it does come down to, to the parents. And, uh, you know, no matter what's being put in them outside of those doors, it's our responsibility to make sure that they know the truth. And uh, it's a huge blessing to, to be able to uh, dedicate a child today. And... Uh, to dedicate a child to, to Christ and to dedicate uh, a child's uh, upbringing to him and to, to dedicate uh, just the, the parenting of that child to the Lord. And uh, with that, I'd like to call up uh, Hadley, Cameron, and, and little Lucius, if y'all will please come forward. Um, while they're coming forward, I, I would like to share a piece of scripture with you. Uh, it's from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, starting with verse 4. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words which I command to you this day shall be in your heart. And you shall teach them diligently unto your children. And shall talk to them when you sit in the house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes, and you shall write them upon the post of your house and on your gates. What that piece of scripture is telling us, that piece of scripture is telling us it's not just when we're having conversations with our children, it's it's everything that we do with our children. It doesn't matter if we're, we're walking, it doesn't matter if we're talking, it doesn't matter if we're sleeping, it doesn't matter if we're just doing the dishes, whatever it may be, we are to be that example, and we are to be sharing the Lord with our children. And as you come to dedicate Lucius today, there's responsibilities that come with being a parent in Christ. The first is uh, it's our responsibility, your responsibility, to be faithful to the Lord. Little eyes see everything. Little eyes see how we act at home. Little eyes see exactly what's going on. Now, does that mean that we're, we're perfect all the time? No. But we're faithful all the time. So you can mess up and still be faithful. Faithfulness does not depend upon your success or failure in each and everything that you do. Faithfulness sees its way through your mistakes. Faithfulness sees its way through your hardships. Faithfulness sees its way through even your triumphs. So faithfulness, your children should see faithfulness in all that you do. It's our responsibility to be examples for our Lord. So we've talked an awful lot about the moral law and the shortcut that we discovered in Matthew chapter 22. Love the Lord with all your heart, your mind, and your soul, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. If we live by those principles, our children will see that. Our children will see that that is how the Lord wants us to live, and we can be examples of a godly life. It's our responsibility to be trainers for our children in the Lord. From the scripture that we just talked about, we train them when we are sitting down. We train them when we are walking. We train them when we are lying down. We train them with the Word of God in our hands. That means that a, a child should see a Bible before the age of 12 when they come into youth group because all their friends are there. They should come with the knowledge of Christ well before they, they enter into school. See, if we implant... Christ in their minds and in their hearts before they walk in the school, it doesn't matter what the school teaches because the light is already shining in their heart. Amen. They already know the truth. They can look and they can say, that ain't right. <coughs> and then it's also ours to train them with the word of God written on items in our home. So, so we have scripture wherever the eye can see. We, we, we have to be able to do that with our children. It's our responsibility to keep the Lord before our children always. Now, that can be interpreted two ways. Keep the Lord before our children. Absolutely. There, there is a chain of command in the way that we love. Number one, God. 
Number two, my wife. Number three, my child. Those things get skewed. All of a sudden, the process isn't right. We put our child before God. We're worshiping our child, not our God. There's a problem there. We put our wife before our God. There's a problem. We're worshiping our wife. You can substitute husband, whatever you want to substitute. But what this is talking about is this is talking about keeping the Lord before our children, which means that, that we are keeping the Lord in front of our children at all times. We are aware of what they are watching. We are aware of what they are seeing. We are aware of what they're being taught. We may not always like it, you know, sometimes especially in a public setting, a public school setting, or, or even just a public forum, we may not like what's being said, but it's our responsibility to pull our children inside and say, yes, this is what some people believe. This is what some people believe, but you know the truth. So, do you... Um, as parents, Hadley and Cameron, do you agree to do those things for your child? Yeah. Praise God. Praise God. So I'm going to ask just a, a series of questions real quick and uh, answer as you will. And then we will, uh, we will dedicate Lucius with prayer. Um, do you promise to love the Lord with all your heart, your soul, and your mind? Yeah. Do you want to train your children in the love of the Lord? Do you know the disciplines of faith? Do you have a regular time for devotions? And do you promise to, to put the Lord before Lucius at all times? Solution. Here we go. All right, Lucius, we're going to pray for you real quick, okay? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we pray that uh, as we dedicate Lucius to you, that not only do you receive him, but you protect him, that you watch over him, Lord, that you be with his parents, Lord, that you allow their home to be the safe haven that it needs to be, Lord, and that you surround them with the Holy Spirit in all situations, Lord. May we be filled today till it overflows, Lord, and may Lucius do mighty things in your name. May his parents continue to grow and develop in their faith and in their love for you, and may he follow in their footsteps, Lord. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity, and we thank you for the generation that's to come. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. Amen. There you go. And with that, this has been dedicated to the Lord. And uh, guys, thank you for all that you do, and uh, may peace be with you. God bless you. <laughs> Time we're going to worship the Lord with our tithes and offerings. If I can get Craig and Anthony to come forward. <coughs> you hear Pastor Scott talk about it time and time again. It's uh, it's not tied to your wallet. Uh, each of us has been given so many different blessings and gifts and talents, and it's what can you pour back into the kingdom of God uh, more than just your money. Yes, money's great. It takes money to run things, but it's more than that. Um, you know, I've been thinking about it this week. I hope that you have too. That you come in here uh, intentionally. What can I pour back into the kingdom of God? And so this morning, I just pray that you'll take the time to to reflect on that. You know, ask God what it is that He's giving you this week that uh, that you can put back. Uh, Father God, we just thank you. Thank you for this service this morning, God. We thank you that you're uh, you're moving, God. Uh, we can feel your presence in here this morning, God. We pray that you'll take uh, everything that is given and multiply it, Lord. Uh, most of all, we give you our hearts this morning, God. I know that's what you desire the most. Uh, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.
Thursday at 5 o'clock, we have the high set training. Uh, guys, if you are looking for uh, a way to continue your education, and uh, that's what the Lord's laid on your heart, here is your opportunity, 100% free, even hand you pencils. Uh, that's always amazed me. Pencils and paper are provided. I just can't, I, that blows my mind. Uh, as someone who's, who's, who's spent a, a pretty penny on education, uh, Man, that's the good life right there, getting it for free. So come on down. Uh, also on Tuesday and Thursday, uh, starting at 7.30, 7, 7 or 7.30? Meeting, 7, 7. Okay, so 7 o'clock, we've got uh, the, the NA meeting that meets downstairs. Uh, again, incredible meeting. Uh, lots of people, good, good, good. Diversity of people. Um, you know, one of the things that that meeting provides, and, and a lot of those meetings provide, is it gives us an opportunity to see that, uh, that, that things like addiction and, and things uh, things that, that, you know, consume us that doesn't care about where we come from, doesn't care about what kind of money we have, doesn't care about our, our skin tone, doesn't care about any of that. Uh, you know, the, the enemy's job is to tear us down no matter what we look like, no matter where we're from. And uh, that, that meeting and, and those other meetings are, are always a good opportunity to see that, hey, you know what? I'm not the only one that's afflicted with this right now. I've got people I can count on. I've got people that understand what I'm going through. I've got people that, that, that love me. And, uh, and, and so I highly recommend uh, coming on Tuesday and Thursday if you're looking for a meeting. On Wednesday, we have Holy Hump Day. Uh, at 6 o'clock, we will be eating... <laughs> Yeah. Absolutely. Tacos. Big game for tacos. I mean. So, you know, every week I give y'all homework from the pulpit. I'm going to give you a question right now that I want you to ponder. Is a taco a sandwich? I mean. That's just, that's just a question. Y'all think about it during the week. Feel free to answer it on Friday, on Wednesday when you come in. Is a taco a sandwich? I mean, it has the makeup of a sandwich, but not necessarily the texture. So, I mean, it's something to think about, something to ponder. Because uh, I'll also throw this out there. We consider pita bread a sandwich. And, I mean, it's the same construction there. So, uh, is a taco a sandwich? Um, and then on Saturday, we've got our laundry ministry. Uh, noon, it is the... Laundry mat right down here by the Sunoco, across the street from Ole Guacamole. Uh, please come. Uh, it is a great opportunity to to serve your community. It's a great opportunity to uh, to be there for people that are not feeling loved. Uh, our city council has done a wonderful job of making the homeless not feel loved, and uh, I don't necessarily think that that's part of their job. But man, they excel at it. Um, but. Uh, 
And if any of y'all are watching, hello. Um, so that, they've, they've done a great job making it miserable, even more miserable for our homeless community. Uh, you know, not just tearing down, not just removing them from camps, which, you know, I can understand in certain instances, but also taking their stuff, throwing it away, making sure that it's cut up and unusable and uh, just, you know, kicking a man while they're down. So uh, it's our job in Christ to lift them up. Amen. Let the, let the politicians do what the politicians do and let the church do what the church does, right? Um, and then on Sunday, we will be right back here, 11 a.m. for service. So uh, is there anything that I forgot or anything that I need to bring up? Okay. Uh, the only other thing that I do want to add is uh, first Saturday in July, we are going to be doing project projects again. This time we're going to be at Arnie Hill and Elizabethan. So we will meet here at 11 and travel from here together because I know that not everyone knows where Arnie Hill is. Those of y'all that do understand that uh, we need to be there. So uh, so that's that's coming up the first Saturday of July. Now, last week, where we ended up was we ended up talking about telling everyone about Jesus. That was that was the last thing that, that we that we started to touch on. And you know, we we also touched on the reason that the church does not share Jesus as frequently or as we are commanded in Scripture. And what it falls down to is two things. It falls down to fear and ignorance. Um, fear, fear can come from a lot of places. Uh, it could be fear of, of, of being judged uh, because of your love for Christ. Well, let's get that fear out of the way. Christ tells us that we will be judged for loving him and that we will suffer persecution and that we will face hardships because of his name. And he says to consider those things a joy. So if someone does not like us for Jesus, praise God. That means that we are wearing Jesus properly. The second thing is ignorance. We don't have to be biblical scholars. I think that part of the reason that we have we've fallen short on the evangelism side is because everyone thinks that they have to come with a theology degree in order to share Jesus. And nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, we can even go back and look at the original 12 disciples and we see that those men were not men of education. Those were workers. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, part of the reason that, uh, that some of the books of John, uh, that John wrote, gets so much criticism is because his Greek was so terrible. He was not a scholar man, but he knew Jesus. Amen. And that's what we need to focus on. We need to focus on the fact that we know Jesus. See, that's, that's what we're sharing. We're not, we don't have to share. You can share every Bible verse in the world with an atheist, and it doesn't make a difference. You know why? Because he does not have the Holy Spirit. He or she does not have the Holy Spirit. Will not understand completely what you're talking about. And doesn't believe a word that you're saying. Thus, the title atheist that's attached to them. What will they believe then? What will they believe? What is it that people need to see in order to believe in Jesus Christ? People need to see you. You are the fruit. You are the tangible evidence. You are the key to opening up people's minds and hearts so that the Holy Spirit can do His work. And we're going to talk about how Jesus said to do these things. So we cannot start talking about evangelism without knowing that it's biblical, right? Because if we're going to do something of the Lord, we have to do what? We have to what? Make sure it's biblical, right? Make sure it stays on our minds. And number three, make sure that we have peace. Well, with evangelism, I guarantee that those three things will match up. It is biblical. We're going to go over a verse here in just a minute, and you will see exactly how biblical it is. Number two, does it stay on your mind? If you know Jesus, Jesus is on your mind. Amen. If you know Jesus, you can't get Jesus off of your mind. Even when you think Jesus is off your mind, you're like, oh gosh, I can't believe that. Jesus is always on your mind. So he does not leave your mind. And what gives you peace? Sharing joy gives you peace. Sharing the, the key to your life gives you peace. So nothing can bring more peace than the sharing of Jesus Christ. So it matches up with the criteria of it being of God. In Matthew chapter 28, starting with verse 16, Jesus gives what is called the Great Commission. 
I stole this from Pastor Pete at Antioch, and he stole it from someone else, because I know that person, and I also know that that person stole it from somewhere else. So I don't know where it originated, but uh, I will say, Pastor Pete and Dr. Derringer, I'm going to give you all the credit for right now. It's called the Great Commission, not the Great Suggestion. That means it's a commandment. Straight from the mouth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain on which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Which means that he is fully God. He has full authority to give the commandment that he's about to give. Have any of y'all, like, worked on that job and you got the guy that has, like, zero rank, really zero experience, really zero anything, but he wants to tell you everything to do, right? And you just kind of ignore him and let him be because he doesn't have authority. Well, Jesus isn't that dude. Jesus does know. Jesus does have authority. And Jesus is the, the, the final judge. So we have to understand these things. Jesus has the authority to command us to do what he's about to command. And he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. So not just the people that look like us, not just the people that talk like us, not just the people that, that smell like us, not just the people that, that we, not just our little circle, with all nations. So that means that if we're going to share Jesus properly, if we're going to share Jesus with the masses, what we have to do first is we have to clean house. We have to clean our hearts and our minds. Because I, can, I, I guarantee that everyone here has a presupposition, which means a, a pre-thought idea of a certain type of people. Doesn't matter. I mean, it, it's, it's all wrong. But everyone has presuppositions. We need to get rid of those presuppositions if we're going to share Jesus properly. Because it says all nations. It doesn't just say the nations that resemble you. No, it says all nations. And it says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The triune God. Three persons, one God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Father is God, but is not Jesus. Jesus is the Son. And Jesus is God. But he is not the Holy Spirit. So, we have to share that truth. We have to share the truth of a triune God because it's a triune God that we worship. It's a triune God that we've been called to worship. And we see many more examples of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit being mentioned in Scripture, such as Jesus being baptized. Mm -hmm. Baptized, the Holy Spirit comes upon him like a dove. The Father says, this is my Son of whom I am proud, right? So we got the Father, we've got the Son, and we've got the Holy Spirit, all three in one location, which means that it's three people, not just one. Amen. One God, three people. We have, to, we have to keep that in mind. And it says, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Notice that, that Jesus, when he was living and when he was walking, what did he, what did he do? What, what kind of examples did he give? He gave examples all tied to the moral law. He did not take his disciples and teach them to do sacrifices. He did not take his disciples and teach them to, uh, to, to follow Mosaic law. Now, he said that, that no part of that law would, would go away, that it would only be stronger. And what he's talking about is he's talking about the moral law. So the moral law is the things that are tied to our morality that last through all space and time. He can't be talking about the civil law. Because the civil law was the law for the Israelites going into the promised land so that they would be able to run where they live. Civil law, we're, we're bound by civil law of Johnson City, Washington County, state of Tennessee. Our civil law looks different than that civil law. It's not the ceremonial law because Jesus fulfilled that. It's the moral law. So the moral law, and we just talked about that when we did the baby dedication, the easiest way for us to remember the moral law and to abide by the moral law is to follow the, the two of the greatest commandments, 
Love the Lord with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. If we do those two things, we're in pretty good shape. But it is a continual process. And it says, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So God is always with us. God has never abandoned us. Jesus has never abandoned us. As a matter of fact, when Jesus left, he promised us a helper. The Father provided us a helper in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not walk outside of our body and hold our hand. The Holy Spirit is now living inside of us. So now we have two natures. We have our human nature, which we all know where that gets us. Human nature usually gets us in trouble. And we have a divine nature, which comes from the Holy Spirit. And that's where the good comes from. That's where the desire to help the homeless comes from. That's where the desire to share the gospel comes from. That's where the, the, the desire to see people succeed comes from. That's where, that's where jealousy fades away. That's where anger starts to dissipate. That's where, that's where the good stuff comes. So we've got that divine nature inside of us. And we've got the ability to tap into it. We've got the ability to sh slowly, slowly shut down that human nature and move into that divine nature. It, 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 it's not an all-at-once thing. We have to know that God, God is a, a God of organization. He's going to show us the steps that we need to take and the way that we need to take it. So that piece of scripture is extremely important because it tells us that we are not just... God doesn't just desire us to share the gospel and to share him in a meaningful and powerful way. He doesn't just desire us to do that. He expects us to do that. He expects us to do that. Why does he expect us to do that? Why do you think he expects us to do that? You do it with everything else in your life. You get a new car, I guarantee it's up on Facebook within two minutes. <laughs> you get a new girlfriend or boyfriend, oh my gosh, it's out there in a heartbeat. Are we putting Jesus out there like we're putting those things? Come on. No, no. But all of our successes we put out there, right, because it's us. Mm, don't think so. I could put my successes out before I knew Christ right now. Just did it. There weren't any. Man. There weren't any. It was bad. It was real bad. Yeah. My wife is the one laughing because she knows. Well, JD's laughing because he knows too. But uh, but that's 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 the truth of the matter. You know? Yeah. Great. You got a new car. Look what God blessed me with today. Amen. Great. You got a new boyfriend or girlfriend. Man, I've been praying for this for a long time, and it's it's incredible to get a godly man or a godly woman. Thank you, Jesus. See, we can glorify God through those things as well. But we often choose not to. But the world needs to know that those good things are yoked to Jesus. The world needs to know that, that every aspect of our lives is yoked to Jesus. And the way that we let the world know is we go out and we tell them. Now, there's lots of different methods and ideas as far as how do you evangelize? Oh, I don't know how many evangelism books I've read. Probably too many. There's one called Evangelism Explosion. Oh my goodness. It's incredible. It's incredible. It teaches you how to, how to reach the masses with a simple step-by-step -step plan devised by man. Incredible. <laughs> Huh. Wow. Then there's always, you know, the door-to-door the -door approach. Leave some flyers, maybe. I mean, it's cool. It's cool. But it, it, it's like trying to hit a target 300 yards downrange with a shotgun. It ain't going to happen all the time. It's just going to spray and spread. Shotgun approach. Not necessarily the best, most effective and efficient approach. So where do we learn how to do this? I mean... Where do we learn how to evangelize? Where do we learn how to, to share Jesus properly? Well, me personally, I like the method that I use. And, and why do I like the method that I use? Well, because it comes from the Bible. See, in my old age, I've become smart enough to know I'm dumb. 
Let that simmer for a minute and think about it, right? I've become smart enough to know I'm dumb. And I, I've also become smart enough to know that, that, that my ways and my, my, what I think might be the best way never matches up to what Jesus tells me. So Jesus in Matthew chapter 10, which is where we're going to be today, tells his 12 disciples how to evangelize. See, now, in some instances, people would say, but this is an isolated incident. This is Jesus sending his 12 main guys out. He's given them instruction on how to do the job that they're going to be doing when he leaves and, 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 and goes and takes his rightful place next to the Father. This is an isolated incident. This is an isolated incident. Well, it is until you get to Luke chapter 10 and you realize that he tells it to 72 more people. The exact same method, the exact same way. You don't believe me? When you leave here today, go read Luke chapter 10. I was going to read both of them today, but then I was like, you know what? I'll let them read it. But Luke chapter 10 and Matthew chapter 10, two different situations, Jesus gives the same instruction. So what does that tell me? That tells me that Jesus had a plan, Jesus had a method, and if we follow that plan and method, we will start bearing more fruit. Because that's what we're called to do. We're called to bear fruit. So we're going to read this and we're going to discuss it. And I want just certain things to be out in the open and to, to, to be there for us to, to realize our responsibility versus God's responsibility. Because God has a huge hand in evangelism. God's hand is bigger than our hand in evangelism. So in, in Matthew chapter 10, starting with verse 5, it says the 12... These 12, Jesus sent out instructing them. So here comes the instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans. Okay, context time. The Jews were in a time and space within the, the, the Roman Empire where the Gentiles, the Romans, the other Romans, were not big fans. They tolerated, but they were not big fans. So Jesus was instructing his people not to go into an audience that had a negative presupposition about what they were bringing. Bringing it to the Romans and to the Samaritans, because the Samaritans and the Jews did not get along. What that would have done is it would have made their job harder. You look at any other discipline in which you're sharing with someone else. You've got to build confidence. And going to your enemies to share this message is not the best way to build confidence. So the next thing we see, it says, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So instead of going to the Gentiles or the Samaritans, go to the people you know. Go to the people you grew up with. See, the, 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 the lost sheep of Israel are the people that, that, that the, the, the disciples grew up with. These are the people that they went to Torah school with. These are the people that they fish with. These are the people that they live in the town with. These are the people that they know. So Jesus is saying, go to the people that you know are lost. Go with an audience that's already familiar with you. Go talk to someone who already loves you. Go talk to someone that you already love. Go talk to someone whose ears and heart might already be prepared to hear the message that you're bringing. Don't make this harder than it needs to be. I love a challenge as much as the next guy. But if I'm going to share Jesus Christ and I'm... I'm 60 to 70 percent sure that this is fertile soil over here and I'm zero percent sure over here I'm going to 60 to 70 percent because I want the seeds that are planted I want them to grow I don't want them to get choked out by the world I don't want them to be trampled on I want them to grow and the best way to do that is with people that we know and it says and proclaim as you go saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand the Messiah, the Messiah is at hand. 
The end times are at hand. See, the end times started at the birth of Christ. See, people are always talking about, I love hearing that pastor late night. Sometimes I, I leave the TV on and I'll wake up and there'll be some guy with like glasses that are like this thick, wearing a suit from like 1972, looks like a carpet with a shower curtain for a tie or something. And, and he's like, the end of days are coming. Well, no, they're not. The end of days are here. The end of days started. It, 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 click, stopwatch. It's already started. It started with the birth of Jesus. It says, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You have that power. You know what's keeping that power from manifesting itself? Your faith. If you're praying for healing and you don't believe that, 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 that healing comes from God and you don't believe that Christ has the power to heal, that, that's, that's a prayer that, that's just falling into nowhere. We pray in faith. We pray in hope. We pray with the knowledge that God can do these things. So that's one way that we share Jesus. Notice that, that not once has he even said, quote John 3.16. Mm -hmm. Mainly because John 3.16 hadn't been written yet. <laughs> Jesus said, do these things. Share me. Share my love. Because you by yourself do not have the power to heal. You by yourself do not have the power to cast out demons. You by yourself do not have the power to raise the dead. However, with me, you've got it all. Amen. So it's a heart condition. Where is our heart when we're praying for these things? Where is our heart when we're doing these things? Where is our heart when we're sharing? What are we yoked to? Is it empty words or is it true faith? You received without pain, give without pain. I will tell you right now, if, if, if I wanted to make money in ministry, and I know that a lot of people have said that I am making money in ministry. I'll give you my taxes if you want. Um, if I wanted to make money in ministry, you know what I would do? I would become a professional evangelist. Yeah. I'm sorry. If you're going to share Jesus with me and then get a check for $600,000, i got to question your motivations a little bit. Because I don't know about you, but after I came up off that barroom floor, and after I looked up to the sky and I realized that it was Jesus, and I was like, I'm giving myself to you. I need to know you. I didn't get a bill. I didn't. I paid nothing for that salvation. So why in the world should I charge you to share that information with you? Jesus is our Lord and Savior. Free of charge, folks. Yeah. Have God. a great day. Just kidding, we're not done. So, <laughs> it goes on and it says, Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. So he's telling them, he's saying, don't leave here thinking that you need more than what I've already prepared you with. Don't leave here thinking that you need more stuff. You go out here and I will provide for you as long as your heart is pure, as long as your faith is right, and as long as you are doing my work, I will provide for you. I will provide tunics. I will provide sandals. I will provide food. You don't need to leave with all these provisions. You just need to go. See, that's, that's one of the things that, 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 that also entraps us as evangelists is we want to over-prepare. I want to wait till the time's right. That's like waiting, it's like waiting to go to church until you are right. You wait forever. None of us would be in this building. I wouldn't be behind this pulpit. So Jesus is saying, don't wait. You don't need all this extra stuff. Everything that you need, I've given you. So, so far, what we've seen is we've seen that he's saying to walk out of here with our faith. He's telling us to share our faith with the people that we know. And he's telling us that we're fully equipped to do so. So why are we fearful? And why do we feel ignorant? 
Jesus just told us otherwise. Jesus just said, not only am I commanding you to do this, but you are equipped and you are prepared. Go along. And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. So, and we're going we're gonna to do a synopsis here at the end, but what we see right there is we see another example of Jesus shooting down that shotgun method. When you enter a house, okay, so he says, he says, whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. So you find that person, okay? And it may take a couple of people. But you stay with that person. Why? 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 Another big mistake that we do. Okay, so we live in an instant gratification society. All right, there's, uh, I've talked about this book before, Neil Postman, Amusing Ourselves to Death, written in 1980. Great book talking about medium and message and everything else. The only thing that he got wrong was he said he did not believe that computers were going to be the wave of the future. He missed just a little bit on that one. But what that book shows us is it shows us that, that people consume 30-second blurbs of information, and that's about it anymore. Well, Jesus is saying, don't give them a 30-second blurb about me. Okay, I, look, I love it when I see someone say, I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Praise God, okay? That's awesome. That's awesome. But what kind of salvation is that? What kind of salvation is that? Because I, was, I look, before I knew Christ, if you were coming to me to talk to me about Jesus, I'd tell you anything that you wanted to hear to get you to leave me alone. And you know what? I knew you'd leave me alone because you were just there to, to, to hear the yes and go out and tell your buddies, I got a salvation! No, you didn't. You've got zero salvations. Yeah. I do too. I've never saved anyone. Zero salvations and zero salvations. God is the Savior. I am a messenger. I am a vessel just like you. Amen. But what Jesus says, Jesus says, when you find someone who's worthy, you keep your butt there. Why do you stay there? You stay there to teach and instruct and to make disciples. It goes all the way back to the, to the Great Commission. Don't make a believer, oh, good job. You, you annoyed someone to the point that they said they love Jesus. Congratulations. Great job. Maybe we can yell. No. We stay and we instruct. This is who Jesus is. This is what Jesus did for you. This is why Jesus did that for you. This is how you love like he loves. This is what you share. This is... And that is love. Love is staying with that person once they profess that they know Jesus Christ and teaching them about Jesus. You want to make sure that those seeds fall on fertile soil? Then stay and teach. Amen. Don't be lazy. That's a lazy evangelist. And as you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. My peace is Jesus Christ. And anyone who has peace, it has to be Jesus Christ because there's no other source of peace in this world. Why do you think we've been at war ever since the fall of man? Peace is an illusion until you come to know Jesus. So Jesus isn't saying go in and share Scott's peace because Scott's peace is not peace. What Jesus is saying, Jesus is saying you go into that house and you share me. You share me. And sharing Jesus isn't just scripture. Now, it does come to scripture too, believe me. That's part of teaching someone to be a disciple. It's teaching them how to receive God's word. Because God's word is what allows us to communicate with the Holy Spirit, understand what the Holy Spirit is saying, understand what we're saying to the Holy Spirit, and understand how to follow those things, okay? So scripture is very important. But when I come into a house, or you come into a house, or you come into the house, we're not sharing just empty Bible verses that we're quoting right and left. No, we're sharing our people which is the love of Christ. 
And if you're sharing it with people that you know, as he is instructed, they know that something is different about you because you were not a peacemaker before that. Amen. See, the dynamic of your change is what's going to allow you to share the gospel successfully. Not anything you did, not anything you said, but the dynamics of your change, which is through Jesus and Jesus alone. He says, and if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly I say to you, it'll be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. That's the last piece of that message, okay? Jesus is telling us, if they don't listen, dust off your feet and walk away. Walk away. Because <laughs> the judgment is real and the judgment is coming. And the judge is he. Amen. And we all know what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. And Jesus is saying, if they won't listen to you, if they won't receive him. See, that's, that's the key to that piece right there, okay? If I'm sharing me, just Scott, right? Just Scott's piece or Scott's idea of peace. And they, they, they turn that away, fine. Probably better for him. But if I share Jesus Christ and I share the true love of Christ with you and you turn that away, that's not my problem anymore. I've done what was required of me. I've done what was asked of me. You or them have chosen to ignore the Holy Spirit, to ignore Jesus Christ, to ignore the truth that's been put before you, and there's a consequence that comes with that, and that consequence is eternal. It's not temporal. See, that's the, that's the, the thing about me and Jesus. If I screw up, it's temporary. I might hurt you for a little bit, but you're going to get to a better spot. If you deny Jesus, you might... Have some fun while you're here, but the day is coming where you're where you end up. It's not going to be nice. See, because if we're going to share the truth, right? We've got to share both sides of the argument. We've got to share. We've got to share the truth of Jesus, but we also have to share the truth of damnation. We have to share the truth of hell. Because the message that we're delivering is an eternal message. An eternal message. So here's a little cheat sheet that I want us to take with us. And I want us to practice these things. I want y'all to share Jesus. Amen. As a matter of fact, I'm going to do what I, you see, I, I, I bring a message similar to this once a year at least. I do, because evangelism is a huge part of, of, of becoming a disciple and being a disciple. Also, evangelism is what the Lord laid on my heart as far as what I'm good at. I happen to be a pretty good evangelist <laughs> um, because of him. Um, it also gives me a chance to, to, to use the apologetics degree that I earned and uh, you know argue for the faith. It, it's, it's fun. Man. It, it is fun. Sharing Jesus is fun. We can make it fun. It should be joyful. If there's no other great, if there's no greater joy in your life than Jesus, then what can be a greater joy than sharing Jesus? I can't think of one. But you see, here's our little cheat sheet. It's got eight points, okay? Most of us have more fingers than that, right? Is anyone here with less than eight? All right. I got to ask, man, because I, I've, I've, I've said that before. I mean, not about the eight points, but I, I've said, you know, we're just going to talk about, you know, ten things, you know, same amount of fingers we have. And I've had people be like, I've only got seven fingers. And I'm like, oh, gosh, okay, take your shoes off, buddy. Um, so, number one. All is all. Okay? All is all. If you're in Christ, you're my brother or you're my sister, period. And even if you're not in Christ, you're my neighbor. So I love you. All is all. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter what you've done. 
That includes everybody. When we go into the jails, we, we take a special day and talk to just the sexual offenders. A lot of people are like, how could you do that? Well, I don't know about you, but my God's big enough where his blood can wash away any sin. Come on. So we don't necessarily have to, to, to like the people that we're sharing the gospel with or like what they've done, but we better love them. So all is all. All nations means all nations. Number two, be bold, be unafraid. It's a skill. A lot of it comes with the way you talk. A lot of it comes with the way that you carry yourself. You know, this may sound goofy, but you should be able to quote and, and, and say the three little bears with confidence in a, in a passionate way where people are like, dang, that Goldilocks is a brave girl. <laughs> be bold. Be confident. We've all been bold and confident with stupid stuff that we say, right? I know I have. If we're going to be bold and confident with stupidity, why would we not be bold and confident with truth? Be bold and confident. You're sharing the truth. And some of us have maybe been the first time in our lives that we shared the truth. Share. 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 Do not pressure. Your pressure does not lead to someone else's salvation. If you pressuring someone gets them to say that they know Jesus Christ, that's on you, not on Jesus. Share, don't pressure. Look, you plant the seed, just like Jesus said, if it's not accepted, you dust your feet off and you walk away. Because you know what? That seed is sitting there. And someone else may come tomorrow and share that message in a different way. And it may touch their hearts and it may be like, man, this is the second person that has come and told me about this, 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 this man, Jesus. This is the second person that's come. Man, I, now I, I know that there's something going on. Yeah. But if you pressure, if you pressure and you push too hard, when that second person comes, their ears are shut. And again, that falls on you. I'm not, I mean, look, I'm not trying to tear anyone down or beat anyone up. I'm just saying this because this is truth. This is truth. Think about it. Think about where a lot of us come from. And think about how many times people were just pushing, pushing, pushing religion on you. And you didn't want to hear it. What if I came to you and I didn't say anything about Jesus at first? What if I came to you and I told you about a man that had 22 years of addiction under his belt? What if I told you about a man who lied to his wife constantly about his using, even though he had blue rings around both nostrils? What if I told you about a man that, that was in a fight every single night? Same man died on a barroom floor. Drugs were removed from his life. 11 years sober next month. All because of Jesus. See, that story hits home. And that's not pressuring. That's telling the truth because that's my story. And you can't refute my story because I lived it. If you're an atheist, you can argue with me about Scripture. You can argue with me about a lot of things. But you can't argue about my life. And you can't argue about what happened to me. You are the most powerful part of your evangelism. Your testimony is the key to your evangelism. What has Jesus done for you? Make it simple. Make it fun. That is fun. Telling people, I was here, now I'm here, and it's because of Jesus. That's a good time. Because not only are you telling someone, but also you're reflecting in your mind, and you're reliving that, and you're seeing the glory of Christ all over again, because it's all over you. And people can't deny that. Remember that there will always be some that receive and there will always be some that do not. It's not your fault. If you're going out and you're sharing Christ in a meaningful way, you're doing what you're supposed to do. I have zero control on how you react to that. So if I walk away and, the, the, and there's been no profession of faith or anything like that, I'm not hurt by it. 
We can't be hurt by that because it's not me that they're denying. Samuel, man. Samuel, he was, he was so upset when Israel asked for a king that he, he was praying to God and, and he said, I'm paraphrasing, but he was like, God, they, sorry, I've let you down. They rejected me. And God said, you didn't let me down. They haven't rejected you. They rejected me. It's not you that they're rejecting. It's the idea of Christ that they're rejecting. Now, you can go and pray for them. You can mourn for them and everything else, but don't beat yourself up over it. Because it's something that's been happening since the beginning of time. We got to remember, Samuel was over 2,700 years ago. And he was facing that problem. If we're still facing it today, then it's a human condition, not a personal reflection. So, some will receive, some will not. If not, move on. Remember that evangelism is the beginning of the process, not the end. See, evangelism is what gets the foot in the door. But the discipleship process is what develops people into what God wants. So we don't just go for the quick score. We're there for the long game. We're there to, to advise. We're there to mentor. We're there to direct. We're there to, to help. We're there to pray. We're there to do whatever needs to be done so that the people that we're sharing Jesus with have the best chance of truly knowing Christ. And that's not getting in and getting out. I've already said this one. You're the best evidence. I look out at this congregation and I see miracles. I see miracle, I see miracle, I see miracle, miracle sitting next to each other. I see a miracle, I see miracle, miracle. Uh, miracle. Now, I see miracles everywhere. I see miracles everywhere because God has blessed me with the, with the honor and the privilege of being your pastor, with the honor and the privilege of, of being your instructor in many different ways and uh, allowing me to see what y'all have fought through and, and how Christ has brought you through it. So I see miracles every time I stand in front of y'all, and it's, it's amazing to see. So so you're the best evidence. If I was back in that place where I was an atheist, one of you would be able to touch my heart. I guarantee you. I've got confidence in you. I've got that much confidence in you. And even more importantly, I've got that much confidence in our Lord and Savior. Amen. And then the last thing, just... And he attaches this to, to just about everything that we do for him. Have fun. Be joyful. I mean, if you're, if you're coming up and I mean, it's like, you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. John 3.16 says. I mean, that's not going to do anything for anyone, okay? But man, you come up and you're like, Hey, I haven't seen you in 12 years, buddy. How you been doing? Oh, man. Yeah. Oh, what's going on with me? I pastor a church. And this, that, and other. What? But you fill in your own blank. You may not pastor a church, but by God, y'all change. Yeah. There should be smiles on every single one of your faces. Y'all are alive today. You know, and for a lot of people in this room, that's something that most of the world said would not be happening at this very moment. They said you would have been dead months or years ago. But here you are, God's little miracles running around. So precious. <laughs> so guys, let's do those things this week. Let's share Jesus in a meaningful way. What I want you to do is I just want you to close your eyes for a second, okay? For those of y'all that have attended this church for a while, I know exactly what I'm doing. Those of y'all that have attended this church for a while, I'll be asking you next week. Okay, so I want you to think of someone, someone that you love, someone that you know, someone that you feel like really needs some help, someone that you feel like maybe doesn't 
maybe maybe just doesn't grasp Jesus in, a, in, in the proper way. I want you to just think about them. I want them to burn a hole in your mind right now. I want you to think of their face, and I want you to think of their name, and then y'all can open your eyes. All right, I'm seeing eyes starting to open. Seeing heads come up, good. Take your time, don't worry, we're not in a rush here. I like it, I love it. Hey, think about it. This is a big deal. It truly is. All right, everyone got it? Everyone got it? That person, I want you to talk to them about Jesus this week. I want y'all to talk to Jesus, talk to them about Jesus this week. Look, we just went over it. We're, the worst that they can do is say no. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, if I gave, if we gave up on the first no, guys, we would never have girlfriends or wives. <laughs> That's a fact of the matter. I mean, we're very persistent when it comes to women. And women, you're very persistent when it comes to men. This is our Lord and Savior. How much more important is that? So, like I said, you don't have to. It's all voluntary because I can't force you to do anything. I wouldn't want to force you to do anything. But if you want to truly experience God and all of his glory, you're going to work on evangelism and becoming proficient at the things that we talked about. Next week we're going to talk about a little bit more advanced portion of that. But I feel like that's a big enough piece to bite off right now. That's, that's a pretty daunting little task. But, uh, but y'all are up for it. And, you know, if you, if you forget some of those things, the, the ones that, that just hammer them in your brain, be bold and unafraid. Do not pressure. If they say no, move on. And have fun, be joyful. You know, start with those things. But let's go out this week and let's share Jesus in a way that, uh, that changes lives. <laughs> Y'all dig? You got a prayer request this week? <laughs> Thank you, sir. All right, guys, these are the prayer requests for this week. And uh, like we've said many times, this is a, this is a great honor, man. This is, this is people asking you to pray for them. It's people trusting your faith and your knowledge and your relationship with God. So um, be in prayer for Caleb. Be in prayer for Nicole. Be in prayer for Isaac and Rachel. I like that. Uh, be in prayer for David Craddock and family. Uh, any updates? Still not doing good. Um, I think mom's going up there tomorrow. Hmm. We'll be in prayer for JD's mother to have uh, safe travels to go see her brother and <laughs> family in Pittsburgh. Prayers, prayers for Ralph, uh, Ralph's family, and all the 180 and their families. Uh, Tony Hill, Ginger Hill, and Brian Hill. Uh, praying for all the fathers today. I pray that y'all have a wonderful Father's Day and it's enjoyable. And uh, I'm just praying that we, we, we start to move and, and start to do these things. Uh, I know it's difficult. I know that, that it's hard to, to talk to people sometimes. I understand. I get the concept. But the more we do it, the better we do it. So we got to start somewhere. And fear is not the place to start. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you again for this day. And, and Lord, I pray that as we go out this week that we are full of joy, full of the Holy Spirit, and full of just your grace and your mercy. Lord, I pray that people see it all over our face. I pray that uh, as we share you and as we reveal you, Lord, that the Holy Spirit is moving in mighty ways and that people not only profess you, but they start to live you, Lord. Lord, let us be livers of your word. Let us be doers of your word. Let us do the work that you have put before us. We know that there's going to be opposition. We know that the enemy is at hand, Lord. So I pray that you cover us with protection until we meet again. 
In Jesus' precious holy name, amen. I just want to say, Father, thank you for Yeah, I'll be there all the time.